Hi guys and welcome to Scooby Tube. In this episode, we're going to be talking with Jim, one of the co-founders of Fourth Elements, talking about the company, where it's come from and where it's going. But first up, we're going to have a quick look at the news. In recent news, the past month has been a real rise in the machines. There have been a couple underwater new ROVs. The first one is Ocean One from Stanford University. This has been dubbed the, uh, the robotic mermaid. This is a humanoid uh, sort of ROV. It's got two arms. It even has a face with cameras as eyes, so that the um, the underwater pilot, um, still on the surface, controls it and can manipulate items under the water. It looks a bit creepy, but they say it's going to be the future of ROVs. It's already been used to explore the shipwreck of the Lalane, which is a 1664 uh, shipwreck. Uh, and there's a second ROV called E-Loom, which is a snake-like ROV used to access small, confined and complicated places. Again, it's quite sinister looking, but the design is very handy for getting into small places and around where other ROVs can't. In other news, Israeli recreational divers have discovered a Roman-era shipwreck just off the coast, which is over 1,600 years old and it's full of Roman statues and artefacts which they're working with the Archaeological Society to raise up and there's a lot of interesting um, statues and artefacts coming out of that. Pablo Canestro, a uh, Australian diver, is taking it upon himself to clean up Sydney Harbour. He dives there all the time and he's annoyed at all of the rubbish that gets thrown in the harbour. So he's taken it upon himself just to clean it all up, get all the rubbish out of the water and he's asking for volunteers as well. So if you're out for helping him out and, uh, and you live near Sydney, um, go help him out and just get some trash out of the water. More local news, divers across Kent in the UK are joining a neighbourhood watch scheme uh, to protect many shipwrecks for their historic interest, protecting them from the usual wear and tear of the oceans as well as other divers from removing artefacts, trying to keep the shipwrecks alive so that divers around the UK can dive on them for years to come. Earlier on I had a chat with Jim, one of the co-founders of Fourth Element. Let's take a look. Hi guys, so I'm joined with Jim from Fourth Element. Jim's one of the co-founders and directors of Fourth Element. Hi Jim. Hi Mark. Hi. So, um, so give us a quick sort of, uh, sort of explanation of sort of what you do at Fourth Element, where it came from and where it's going. Well my principal role at Fourth Element is, is in the marketing and the sales side of the business. But it's a small company and we're all involved in pretty much every aspect of mm. it. So uh, I will get involved with product design, um, and we'll get involved with dealing with um, issues, import, export, all sorts of aspects of the of the operation of the company. Sure. But yeah, the buck stops, I guess, with me on sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. Cool. So where did it? Uh, where did the idea of Fourth Element really sort of start from? Where did it come from? Well, um, many people think it's kind of a, an apocryphal story that it started over a beer in Sharm El Sheikh, but it's <laughs> genuinely true. Yeah. And my business partner, Paul Strike, and I were on a Red Sea diving holiday and we'd had a great day's diving and basically doing what most divers do after a day of diving, sitting on a rooftop bar, having a beer. Sure. And we were just chewing the fat, talking about diving. <laughs> Typical divers. As you do. And <laughs> he was... Uh, I think he just finished doing his IDC and IE, and right. during the process leading up to it, he was he'd been getting to think, thinking he was just not able to access and able to get hold of the right kit because he was freezing. Yeah, he was doing the the, the course and the, and the uh, qualifying dives in uh, in land quarry. It was March, I think, when he was doing it, <laughs> and it was pretty unpleasant. Yeah. But then what he realised was when he did his IE, he was being examined by course directors who'd flown over from Paddy's headquarters in California. Sure. They must have access to the right gear, yep. right? But they were freezing too. Yeah. And so our conversation went along the lines of, well, if they can't get access to the gear, maybe it doesn't exist. Mm. Maybe no one can get access to the right gear and maybe there's an opportunity to create the right gear. Sure. And actually, you know, fulfil a need that we've perceived, hopefully other divers out there will perceive that need too. Mm. And then as part of that conversation, we were literally sitting there drinking a beer and, and somebody walked past us with a t-shirt on with a, a slogan from another t-shirt manufacturer. Mm. Um, and it was, yeah, include a profanity. And, <laughs> uh, and I read it and I just I just wouldn't be seen dead in that. Yeah. It, it, it's just not me. 
Uh, it doesn't really say how I feel about a diver, and we then got into a slightly more philosophical conversation about how it feels to be a diver, how, you know, what it means when you learn to dive, and what it, what access it gives you to, you know, 70% of our planet that yeah. you, you don't have if you're a landlocked, you know, ignorant person. Well, I'm, by ignorant, I mean ignorant of the of the joys of being down there. And, and we had this great conversation about this philosophical level and realized that there were, wasn't a lifestyle brand that actually said how we felt to be a diver, sure. how we felt about ourselves as divers. And so my angle on it was that maybe there were other people as well who kind of wanted to wear their sport with pride, a bit like surfers with some of the you know more well-known uh, surfing brands like Quicksilver mm. and these sort of things. That sure. There was almost a, that was almost the uniform of, yes. of, of the surfer and, and, and divers, we didn't quite have that. No. So the conversation went along these two lines and most conversations when you've had a few beers kind of get left at the, you know, left at the, the sort of exit from the bar. Yeah. <laughs> this one just carried on going and, cool. and carried on going and eventually we realised that we had a good idea and we started to work on it and develop it and mm. that was the origin of, 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 of the brand to make the best quality product for diving, yes. for keeping you warm and originally we looked at the product that could be used to augment dry suit underwear and, and wetsuits. Sure. So right now you are definitely one of the sort of premium sort of exposure protection brands. You make a whole range of wetsuits and dry suits uh, and they're all sort of widely sort of appreciated. Um, I've got a fourth element dry suit. Um, right. Yeah, very sort of high attention to detail um, and sort of right now sort of what are your sort of current projects that you're sort of working on? Well, um, we've we've got quite a few new products that are very very close to our hearts, and and Paul, whose main responsibility is the R and D and product development, mm -hmm. he has um, been involved with a, a small part of our, our team for the last two years, developing the uh, our new dry suit and also and the biomap uh, measuring system sure. that we use to take somebody's measurements without a tape measure more reliably than with a tape measure and create, we can create a pattern for somebody's dry suit mm. that is unique to them from the measurements that we take, either with a 3D scan or yep. with two photographs. Yeah. And he's been working <clears throat> and that, that has enabled us to, well we hope, revolutionize the way people buy a dry suit, the way they buy, the, the way they buy the suit, the way they feel about being sized. I mean, it's a pretty invasive process when somebody says, right, okay, I need to measure inside leg now with a, with a tape measure. And, and not only that, but the ability of somebody to actually measure consistently and accurately, it, it, it's extremely difficult to achieve across lots of different people. I mean, even if I were to measure you, I'd probably measure you differently all three times, slightly. Yes, yeah, depending where you start the tape measure, yeah. where you end it. Yeah. Because um, I tried the biomap system at one of the dive shows. So quick, so simple, it just creates a 3D scan of your body and um, it's so accurate, even to the point where if you're wearing a wristwatch, it doesn't accurately measure your wrist measurement. That's right. So yeah. very, very clever system. Yeah, yeah. And, and we've been, we've been, we introduced that to the market in October at the, uh, the, the um, Birmingham Dive Show. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then really had the full launch of Dima uh, in, in the States. And that, that's been going, the rollout of that's been going really well. Right. And uh, it's a really exciting project that still requires a lot of care and attention. And, sure. and, and certainly informing, informing the development of the brand new pattern for our dry suit as well, which we went into that saying, okay, well the criteria for this was that the mobility of, of a diver wearing this suit should be pretty much the same as if they weren't wearing the suit. And that's sure. been our design criteria and we've brought in a, a pattern specialist to, to make sure that those criteria were met. Mm. And then at the other end of the scale, <laughs> uh, we have our swimwear, new swimwear line, uh, which is called Ocean Positive. Yes. And, and this is, and, and again, something that's very close to our hearts but from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. We've always tried to innovate at the technical level and our other products, the Halo 3D and the Arctic and the Xerotherm are probably known to people. But at the other end of it is, it kind of goes a little bit further back towards the roots of how we feel as divers. But not only how we feel to be divers, but also as divers, we're the people who are in the know what it's like down there. Yep. We're the people who actually experience, experience the wonders of being underwater. Mm. And we can also see the damage that we do. I mean, looking at the surface of the sea, 
you can't see what's going on down nope. there, but once you're down there, you can see some of the devastation. Mm. And Ocean Positive is part of our responsibility as divers to try and do something about it in our own small way. And we found out about it, about this project, but it was about three or four years ago, we found out about this project. Um, these um, uh, Dutch and Belgian guys have done a presentation uh, um, at a tech conference in Poland mm -hmm. and a friend of mine came back from this and said listen you've got to you know you've got to get involved with these guys and support what they're doing mm -hmm. and I, I looked a bit into a little bit more detail and Paul and I talked about it and we realized actually there was a bigger opportunity here is actually to take what they're doing which is removing ghost fishing nets Great. from the water mm -hmm. where they've been abandoned by fishermen or, or lost snagged on wrecks and reefs they, they bring them out of the water and then this net and this nylon net is being recycled in such a way that it's almost a perfect recycling process. Yeah. And what, we, what you end up with is a, is a yarn that's as good as, almost indistinguishable from, from virgin nylon, which you can then use to make a product. Sure. And so we're using a, a, a lycra nylon fabric to make swimwear from this and, and essentially tying the provenance of this, this, this raw material mm. to the end user, which is the diver. And then, I mean, the, the problems with ghost nets are, are manifold all over the world. We, the over 64,000, sorry, over 640,000 tons wow. are lost a year. Yeah. And last year, over 100,000 tons were recovered, not entirely by scuba divers. Um, there are other organizations involved in a bigger process to try and remove these nets which trap anything from invertebrates to marine megafauna, the yeah. humpback whales and, and, and whale sharks. To, to remove this from the from the from the water, there are at the government level um, in Norway, for example, there's efforts to remove the net. But at, a, at the smaller levels, there's um, even 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 as small, if you like, as the beach cleanup processes. There's yes. there are there are efforts made to try and um, clean up our ocean environment mm. and make it better. And ha by having somewhere to put all of this net, yes. We're able. People are able to feel like they're they're making a difference, and then if we're able to actually utilise that going forward, mm. people are able to make a difference in what they buy. And I guess the question we're asking people is, you know, well, we would ask, we'd ask all the viewers out there, or, <laughs> if you could wear something that was good for the ocean, would you? Yeah, it's a wonderful story because the more that people wear this kind of uh, sort of clothing, the more demand there is for this um, fabric, so that means that more ghost netting comes out of the ocean, right, so yeah, yeah, yeah. incredible. And the, the, the guys that do it are just are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, the, the, the level of organization, I mean, it, it's technical diving. Sure. The level, of, it's team diving, it's, it's ab absolute commitment to mm. this. But when you actually see what they do, they, you know, it starts out with a wreck or, or re coral reef that's just, snared and it's been scoured by mm. this net moving around and it's sometimes full of seals that have drowned or, or, or sharks that have been been ensnared mm. and, and I mean it's charismatic stuff that's being killed mm. as well as you know lobsters and crabs that have ended up being entangled in there that we, we find it a bit harder to care about mm. but in, in the big they all they all matter but once they're gone and you see you can see the results, especially on reef, where reef recovers really quickly. It's, yes. it's gratifying, and you know, I think we all want something. We all, all want to do something mm. to improve the environment, and definitely. many people don't really know how. Sure. And this is definitely one way that we can, and we're taking that process as, you know, to the to the logical limits with the swim, where we designed it to be ideal underneath. Um, underneath wetsuits so yep. it is designed with the end user in mind as well there's it's very few yeah very yeah. few clasps and ties on the on particularly on the women's styles mm. men's you, it's a little difficult to get all that creative <laughs> with a you know a pair of swimming trunks or some shorts um, but the idea is to produce uh, you know a simple minimalist well designed garment that looks great mm. and has you know good function mm. and uh, that we tried to take that a little further by making sure that the packaging that we use, as you see on the on the on the tabletop there, is yeah. we only use we use recyclable cardboard. Mm -hmm. We don't use any plastic anywhere in the packaging, right. um, and that has sort of informed some of the development of our other products going going forwards. We mm -hmm. we supply um, some of our more recent undersuits that we we developed the Arctic Expedition and the J2 in a reusable. Um, in reusable packaging yes. that actually has a value rather than another plastic bag that someone's going to either chuck away or 
try and find the opportunity to recycle. Yeah, something. hopefully recycle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah hopefully. Uh, so are there any other sort of projects that are going or any future products that you can talk about? Well, um, <laughs> We've just launched the new uh, wetsuit, the, the Proteus 2, mm -hmm. which is an evolution of our Proteus suit, which many independent reviews have said is, been, is the warmest suit on the market. Very popular. We uh, changed the little design to make it uh, a little bit easier to put on. Cool. It, it's still not super easy to put on. It still takes yeah. a bit of work to get on. <laughs> but once it's on, we've, we've introduced some new linings, both on the, uh, the hex core lining on the, on the torso mm -hmm. and uh, thermal linings throughout the suit, which has definitely improved its, um, definitely improved its performance. Mm -hmm. And a couple of little tweaks to the materials that have made it a little bit more flexible as well. And uh, certainly an improved model for the suit. So that we, we, we're actually just uh, launching that this week. Great. Uh, yeah, because Brogius came out quite a while ago, and yeah, so you've six, just six had years ago, yeah. six years. Yeah. So you've just had some time just to tweak it, make it yeah. that little bit better, yeah. and uh, roll it out for the new season. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's great. And then, uh, yeah, we're we're working on a few a few new things uh, in the pipeline. We're hoping to, well, we're we're working very hard on uh, incorporating the ocean Pos the same yarn from the ocean positive line mm -hmm. into other products to okay. try and increase our demand for, for, for this yarn. Yes. Um, and that's you know something that, it, again, is, is part of the process of what we feel is, can we be considered to be part of the custodianship of the ocean? Maybe, but actually it's really about divers and how the way they feel about it and the passion that they feel can be translated into how they spend their money. Yeah. Okay, so are there any other sort of projects that you're looking at right now? Well, uh, Earlier this, earlier this year, we launched uh, Fourth Element Adventures, which is a, a travel project. Cool. For the last, well, ever since we started, we've been supporting expeditions to far-flung places, on, to interesting places, mm. and projects which, theoretically, most people would never dream of being able to go and do. But mm. what we've realized is that actually some of these things are accessible, and we decided that <clears throat> some people, I, we think, are maybe not as inspired by um, the usual fare of liverboard travel or, or, or going to some of the more recognized destinations. Mm. Um, not that that isn't fantastic diving, of course, sure. but <laughs> when you come back from, a, from your holiday and you're telling everybody about your last, last trip, talking about the hundreds of whale sharks that you saw on a dive, and the, and the next guy says, oh yeah, I did that last year, it doesn't feel as special. Sure. So our, it's nothing to take away from the individual experience, but what, we, what we're aiming at is, is trying to find experiences that people will want to try that are genuinely new. Mm. So for example, we've, we've launched a, a, a couple of trips uh, next year. One is uh, altitude ice diving at over 2,000 meters in the Swiss Alps, followed by diving, diving, river diving through the meltwaters under a waterfall wow. um, for a long weekend in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, Phil Short, who's a, a, extremely well known on an international um, stage as a cave diver and explorer, he and uh, Gemma Smith are leading an expedition, um, essentially a week-long trip of, for, for people who've qualified as cave divers and don't really know what to do next. Sure. So they're going to learn the tricks and techniques and, and the skills that are required to actually run a cave diving expedition. Mm. They're going to camp underground for two days, dive through a sump, right. set a camp, dive through another sump, come back, stay in the camp again, <laughs> and have, ba have essentially had an experience that is unlike anything you could expect yeah. otherwise. Yeah. And we've got many others in the pipeline um, exploring the Bell Island Mines, which uh, we sponsored the uh, Mine Quest expedition in 2007 and also in this year, mm -hmm. exploring these mines for the first time. And now people can join Jill Hyneth, who is another world-renowned explorer, to go and dive into these tunnels which she has mapped and she has explored and actually do some genuine exploration of their, of, of their own cool. as part of a week's diving with her in Newfoundland, which is a sensational place to dive. Mm. I, I co-led an expedition in 2008 to go and look for a, a, a lost World War II wreck in uh, Labrador. Uh -huh. And uh, my experience of going and actually finding something for the first time, even though it was just an engine of a, of a seaplane, but mm. it was what we were looking for, was mm -hmm. just, just blew my mind. And if we can translate that to the experience of people who just want to go and see and explore, then... Yeah, they just don't have yeah. that sort of avenue 
Um, this yeah. just makes it easier for them to do all that kind of exploring and just sort of get away from the sort of mundane standard drive trips. Absolutely, and we, we've teamed up with um, Andy Torbett, who has been a, one of our team divers for years, mm -hmm. and uh, we're um, developing the Great British Diving Expedition project that uh, he and Monty Halls and uh, and on Fourth Element and Sunto launched uh, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and. Uh, We'll be starting with some exploratory diving in the Sillies uh, next year and looking a little bit, looking at some other projects there. And then Andy's also leading a trip to, uh, to Norway to go and dive in a whirlpool and actually in, in an area where they have the, uh, the fastest, tidal, um, fastest tidal flow in the world that yeah. has been recorded at something like 27, 28 knots. Okay. Not that they'll be diving in that part, <laughs> yeah. of course, uh, but uh, you know, he's well known for that kind of approach to adventurous diving and yeah. we believe that you know you do it for the adventure it's a that's why we do it mm. I mean you can't be the world's number one scuba diver you can't there isn't anything like that so why do we do it and it's about being on being adventurous going out there and exploring and that's always been the ethos of the fourth element brand and now hopefully we can offer people the opportunity to grasp that and go for it very cool wow cool uh, well, thank you very much for joining me, Jim. Uh, this has been Jim from Fourth Element. So, thanks again, Jim, for joining me there from Fourth Element. You can browse all of the Fourth Element equipment on our website, simplyscuba.com. Earlier on in the month, I had a chance to go diving with uh, Mares in Rapallo, Italy. So, let's check that out. Thanks for watching and safe diving. If you like that video, give us a thumbs up, click on the subscribe button and check out some of our other videos.